It's getting a stranglehold on God. And of course, you don't really serve your fellow man by doing that. You put him in terrible bondage, as the Pharisees in Jesus' day exemplified only too tragically. They couldn't help a sick man, remember? A hurt man on the Sabbath, because, well, it would endanger them. They may run the risk of falling out with God. So, he had to lie there. He had to be sick. And when Jesus actually helped him, well, that was a cause for complaint. Yes, the fall met a turning in on ourselves, a terrible introspection. And of course, going along with that is the second thing about the fall. It meant that the fundamental desire of man was to lord it over the other person. In other words, if there's any going out towards the other, it is in domination and not in happy service. So when Jesus said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them, he is really saying something about the human race. We're always trying in one way or another to get someone else in our own debt. This is what sin is. This is what the fall meant. You saw it in the Garden of Eden, didn't you? There's an interesting thing to look at the Garden of Eden from this frantic effort of self-protection. Adam hid himself, didn't he? He hid himself, remember. God went looking for him. He hid himself in self-protection. Then when he was found behind the tulip bush or whatever it was, remember what he did in another frantic effort to protect himself. Uh, you know, the woman that thou gavest me, you recall her God. Eve, I believe, was her name. God says, yes, yes, I think I do recall her. Well, as a matter of fact, she remembered the woman you gave me. Frantic effort at self-protection, blaming someone else. And when Eve was uh, introduced into the discussion, she said, well, we did really wonder how the serpent got here. Uh, it was extraordinary to find him here once we'd arrived on the scene. God, by implication, of course, you must have put him there, mustn't you? I mean, you've created everything. You know, the serpent... You know, the one you put in the garden. Well, as a matter of fact, he suggested, and we've been doing it ever since, haven't we? And it's no accident that the first recorded incident after that is one slaying another. See, the whole of history has been like that. Dominating. The nuclear, the atomic weapon race in this country and other countries. It's all a frantic effort. And I'm not pronouncing on atomic weapons or anything like this. I'm just saying what it really is. It's a frantic effort at attempting to stop the other from getting the jump on us. Isn't that right? And it's, you know, Whatever else you say about it, brothers and sisters, doesn't it seem a bit childish, you know, when you open Newsweek or whatever it is and uh, Russia says, oh, we've got the best weapons. It's like two little children in the backyard, isn't it? You know, I've got a better cricket bat than you have. And the other fellow says, no, you haven't. See, mine's got a blue line down it. Yours hasn't. You know, well, this, this is a better weapon than the Russians. And now the Russian says, no, this is, we're really ahead of the Americans. And, they're not like two children across the fence. Whatever else you say about it, it's extraordinary. In this frantic effort of self-protection, the obverse side of which is a holding the other under. In other words, our freedom consists in another's bondage. Our freedom consists in another's bondage. In order for ourselves to be free, we must bind others. Now, you read in the theological textbooks, 
that creeds are an expression of love. And I think that is true. But they're also an expression of bondage. And it's surprising at times to find churches and Christian people who will lament creedalization in the history of theology, who will resort themselves to creedalizing their people out of frantic fear of loss of power. Is that not true? Our freedom consists in the bondage of others and sometimes that's bondage to a creedal statement. Is that not true? Creeds are to be the free expression of love to our Heavenly Father for what He's done in Christ. Not as a phylactery of bondage. But you see, we have to have it. If we ourselves are going to find a freedom outside the gospel, we have to find it in the bondage of others. If America is going to be free, it has to be in the bondage of the Russians. And if Russia is going to be free, it has to be in bondage of the Americans. And this is what the nuclear race is really all about. Now, I'm not pronouncing outside of that. I'm not saying whether it's a necessary evil or not, but what I am saying is this, that when you've got the drop on somebody, when they haven't got as good a 45 as you've got, that's a type of bondage. In picture language, if they'll only fire two bullets out of their 45 and you can fire six out of yours, that four bullets that it doesn't fire is a form of bondage. It's a limitation. It's a restriction, can you see? whatever it might be. And of course, the third thing about the fall is that man put God into reverse in, in the way that he lived and moved and had his being. Man didn't image God at all. Man gave a misrepresentation Man gave a misrepresentation of God. It's very difficult to see the picture of the serving God from uh, priests who walk along the street with great arrogance and such amidst dire poverty. It's very difficult to see the man, Jesus of Nazareth, born in a, st in a manger. Out of that picture, you see, it's so easy for us to, to misrepresent God. The only church that really, truly represents God is the servant church. And not just verbal servanthood either, but actual, factual, concrete servanthood. God is great. And Jesus tells us in this passage that greatness is to be found in servanthood, not masterhood. And perhaps there's a marginal note about women's liberation and such here. What both male and female have missed, I think, is this, that male's greatness should consist in his service towards woman. Now, if he'd have done that down through the ages, maybe women wouldn't want to be liberated, huh? In other words, the greatness of the male doesn't consist in male dominance. But the thing that the female has lost sight of is this, that the greatness of female won't consist in burning the bra and putting on the overalls and trying to be dominant over man either. That's just reversing the problem. You see, let's, let's face up to it. This business of service, well, we're allergic to it, aren't we? Anything is better than it. It's like a great influenza that we're all afraid we'll catch. Why? Because basically we feel we'll lose ourselves. Basically we feel we'll lose our identity. But Jesus teaches us our true identity is to be found in service. So that the church that doesn't serve and our leaders who do not shine forth valiantly through service, 
and humble deference to others misrepresent God. And of course, the writing is on the wall. Dietrich Bonhoeffer has a very startling passage in his brilliant creative book on ethics, not finished. He, by the way, I might mention marginally, was a great exemplification of this servanthood. Although he was imprisoned by the Germans because of his opposition to Hitler, the guards used to apologise to Bonhoeffer for having to lock him up. He was a great servant. He went around the cells in those terrible concentration camps he, cleaning the wounds of his fellow prisoners and the infestations and washing them and uh, so that, that everybody loved him so much and they were so sad for him. And one said to him, just as he was about to mount the scaffolding, to be hanged by the neck. Someone said to him, well, Dr. Bonhoeffer, this is the end. And he said, the end? This is not the end. This for me is the beginning. He was a servant. He exemplified the spirit of Christ in being a servant. But he has a startling passage in his ethics, I was saying. And that passage is on the natural. And Bonhoeffer's thesis is that this type of thing we're saying here is so interwoven into the nature of the universe and human beings that where we do find this oppression and such, it's only a matter of time before what Bonhoeffer says, the natural reasserts itself. You hold people under long enough. You will hold them under in forced servitude and they'll be nice to you, but it'll be because all the time you're holding a gun at their temple. And things will go along fine, but there will be a great storm cloud that's brewing up all the time that those who are so busy looking after the bondage of others in the interest of their own freedom never really see. And Bonhoeffer says, sooner or later, the natural will reassert itself. People will throw off the yoke, you see. A man like Idi Amin must always live with this constant fear, you see. You never know when your best friend is going to be the instrument of your slave's liberation. <laughs>